Here in Hollywood, California, in an apartment off Sunset Strip, a marijuana pot party is about to begin. A lid of marijuana has been purchased down on the Strip. Illegal, but easily available. Here it is. It weighs approximately one ounce. That's just one ounce of the three to five tons of marijuana smuggled into California from Mexico every week. The first step is to clean the marijuana by shaking to remove the stems and seeds. Next, the leaves are placed between two sheets of roll-your-own cigarette paper, usually held over a container to catch any of the marijuana that might spill. Then it's rolled into a joint, the drug user's name for a marijuana cigarette. It's now ready for use. The girl is toking, smoking marijuana in short, deep breaths and holding it in the lungs as long as possible. The smoker will soon slip from the world of reality into his high, the euphoria that drug abuse brings. In San Francisco, a young man prepares to shoot his LSD. If he took it orally like most do, he'd have to wait 45 minutes for the desired effect. LSD is on the increase in this country, even though it has been known to cause chromosome damage. One popular brand is called White Flats, which features arsenic to heighten the hallucinogenic experience. The youngsters don't realize that arsenic builds up in the system and may prove fatal. Here in the San Francisco Haight-Ashbury district, a youth proudly displays his dope, apparently benzedrine or dexedrine tablets, commonly referred to as uppers, as both are forms of the stimulant amphetamine. Albuquerque, New Mexico. This young man is loaded on downers, which are barbiturates or sleeping pills, known to the in crowd as red devils, blue heavens, or yellow jackets. The trade names are Secanol or Nimbutal. They're extremely addictive and dangerous. Many deaths have resulted as it is so easy to overdose with downers. Denver, Colorado. A young man has just purchased Speed, the street name for methadrine. On the table is a dime bag, $10 worth. Preparation starts by mixing with plain tap water, using his girlfriend's bobby pen to stir. Such highly unsanitary practices are a major cause of infectious hepatitis epidemics spreading among the middle and upper middle class. Because underworld forces have come into the picture, the quality of the drug is uncertain. The user never knows what he's going to get. So first, he must taste to make sure he hasn't purchased bad drugs. A friend ties off his arm with a necktie to raise the vein. The needle is in his arm and blood is backed into the tube to show register. When his friend lets go of the tie, the drug enters the bloodstream. Immediately, the effect is a flash or a rush so euphoric that some compare the sensation to a sexual orgasm. Life expectancy for a steady user from the first fix to the grave is extremely short. Excessive weight reduction is caused by loss of appetite and dehydration during speed runs, lasting from 3 to 12 days. A speed run is followed by a deep stupor called crashing, which may last up to two days. With any attempt to stop using speed, the loss of euphoria induces a terrific psychological craving for more but it can be alleviated by shooting smack, heroin. Here we see a girl in Jackson, Mississippi, supposed to be spending the night with a friend, instead is shooting heroin, one of the most addictive drugs known. San Francisco, California. He is dead from an overdose of heroin. His buddies left him to die in a vacant lot. Drugs have been with us throughout our nation's history. Marijuana was available before the time of Christ and has been proven to cause both mental and physical damage. Why, suddenly, in ever-increasing numbers, is this generation turning to the use of narcotics? The first shocking realization of the so-called generation gap for many parents is the first look into their child's glazed eyes and dilated pupils. Many parents suddenly wonder where they went wrong they must become aware that the generation gap is, in truth, a communications gap, and that it is not entirely family created. Forces outside the home are communicating directly with young Americans in a language designed to be understood by young people and not understood by parents. These forces are taking advantage of the normal confusion among teenagers struggling for identity and purpose in life. 
lacking experience or the time for truly original thinking, they emulate others and parrot what they hear. And what they hear today is causing them to react as they do. Psychological acceptance is a necessary prerequisite before anyone will knowingly take a dangerous drug. The two primary influences creating such acceptance are, first, the youngster's need for peer acceptance. It's the chicken concept, the taunt, you're chicken if you don't. Second, the assurance that everybody's doing it. This assurance has been provided by the mass media. Articles on how young people by the thousands are turning to narcotics have been appearing regularly for several years in Look, Life, Time, Cosmopolitan, Newsweek, McCall's, and a string of others. Bad results may be mentioned, but the overall effect, unfortunately, has been to glamorize drug use and give assurance of widespread acceptance. Music is another strong influencing force. An innocent-sounding song, Along Came Mary, is really about Mary Jane, another name for marijuana. Other popular hits laced with connotations of marijuana are A Rainy Day Woman, Acapulco Gold, The Pusher Man, Voyage into Golden Screen, Mr. Farmer, Rolling Machine, to mention a few. This is the daily diet of children who screen each new hit for some hidden message of sex, drugs, or anti-establishment. So Bogart that joint, my friend. The message is obvious in the new song you're hearing, Don't Bogart that joint, my friend, pass it over to me. In other words, don't hog the marijuana. A joint is often smoked in a group and passed from person to person as the song explains to young listeners. This new language invented to move youngsters by music leaves most parents unaware. Those who do know find it difficult to criticize because of the respectability given the music by the news media. This particular song, Don't Bogart Me, is reviewed by the Los Angeles Times as one of the funniest records of the year. One. In the song White Rabbit by the Jefferson Airplane Group, vocalist Grace Slick tells children to feed their heads. In drug jargon, acid head and pothead are names for the LSD or marijuana user. So when the highly publicized Miss Slick says, feed your heads, the inference is, take drugs. We used to call people advocating the use of drugs dope pushers, but today they're featured on the cover of national magazines. Grace Slick, like many on the pop music scene, makes good copy for the national magazine, no matter what damage it does. You can see why from this interview she recently gave the girly magazine, Cavalier. We all use drugs. We condone the judicious use of drugs by everyone, she says. Kids are going to blow their minds somehow, and this is a better way to do it than racking their car against the wall. Let them groove, do their thing, ball on the grass in the open. To you over 30, that means have intercourse. She says, I dig watching people make love. Another of the avant-garde groups given national publicity by life is the Mothers of Invention. Its leader is Frank Zappa. Life quotes him as saying, It would appear that society's major hang-ups can be cured by sexual freedom, drug freedom, and a hippie economic freedom from work. The 9 to 13 age group, predominantly female, represents the biggest record-buying market in the nation. So the next time you see a new album by the Beatles, it might be well for you to know that their hit, Lucy and the Sky with Diamonds, forms the acronym LSD. Blue Cheer, the title of a top singing group, is also the name for a form of LSD put out by Stanley Osley. Osley, by the way, has made a million dollars selling narcotics to young people in California. Osley has also been the manager of the Grateful Dead group, whose music is designed, like that of Big Brother and the Holding Company, to be listened to under the influence of narcotics. To understand how such music creates the so-called generation gap, note the review of the Beatles' new record, Two Virgins, featuring John Lennon and his girlfriend on the cover. In summary, it claims that every town will have at least one outlet so that a million teenage Susies will be getting the record and taking it home to outraged parents who will not allow that record 
in this house. Win or lose, the result will be a great widening of the generation gap for what magic can counteract the power of John Lennon's naked body? Another powerful force affecting young people is satire. Excellent examples can be found in psychedelic shops selling buttons and bumper strips and posters with all sorts of so-called humorous messages promoting the use of drugs. These shops also have all the equipment needed for using marijuana, roach holders, water pipes, and of course incense burners to hide the odor of marijuana from parents. Posters advertising the delights of marijuana and other drugs are big sellers. What youngster in the know could resist this groovy poster of Christ smoking pot through a hunkah or water pipe? A good laugh getter, and it costs only two dollars. Organized crime refers to youngsters using narcotics as ducks because the kids gobble up anything put in front of them. This is borne out by people like Bill Graham, ex-manager of the Jefferson Airplane, who makes $35,000 per week selling psychedelic posters. With a high-powered promotion from all sides, it is small wonder that we find narcotics being used even in grammar schools. Statistics show an alarming increase in child drug use. In junior and senior high schools of Newport Beach, California, it was found that 80% of the teenagers had experimented with illegal drugs. Music, bumper strips, lapel buttons, and posters aren't the only media tying narcotics to satire and comedy. National magazines of all types are doing their share. The slick publication, I, caters to the money-spending youth market. Here it featured a cartoon strip about a duck that smokes marijuana and enjoys other forms of narcotics. Esquire magazine is untiring in its efforts to expose drug use. In this issue, it gives young people the inside story of a successful young dope peddler on a college campus, how he buys his narcotics, how much he sells them for. Then, enhancing the message that everybody's doing it, Esquire provides a price list of marijuana on every major college campus in the U.S. Narcotics cartoons are printed in numerous national magazines as Playboy, Esquire, I, Cavalier, and others. The narcotics language goes over the head of most adult readers, but has great impact on youth who decode every message. Playboy shows a couple in bed. The caption reads, Oh, Shell, what a beautiful day. We'll take some Dexy, meaning amphetamines or dexedrine, to get us going, smoke some pot, marijuana, to make breakfast taste better, and then we'll take an acid trip. LSD. I've been promising you. And tonight we'll sniff coke, cocaine, to help us make love. And then some second all, a downer, barbiturate, or yellow jacket, presumably to make them sleep. Motion pictures are subtly helping to shape favorable attitudes towards narcotics and sex, along with promoting anti-establishment sentiments. Television helps to keep kids preoccupied with similar ideas. Prime TV time has been devoted to Dr. Timothy Leary, the ex-Harvard professor, to explain the manifestations of religious experience under the influence of LSD. Dr. Leary enters millions of living rooms, telling children to turn on, tune in, and drop out. Such constant enticement of youth is responsible for the thousands who need expert psychiatric help after bad trips on LSD. 4,100 youngsters within 18 months in Los Angeles County alone. Many college professors and high school teachers use their position of trust and influence to fight the establishment and promote the misuse of sex and drugs. They teach that there are no absolutes, no such things as right and wrong or black and white, only shades of gray. Without standards, it is understandable that so many young people become confused and search desperately for the true meaning of life. The student constantly is told that parents have placed too much pressure on this generation to achieve goals which are important only to the parents.